I would like in the beginning to thank uh, my chairman of the department, previous one, Dr. Professor Hamdan Al-Hazmi, who was my partner for the last 20 years. I recently moved to a new place. So I thank the university and for his uh, leadership for unlimited support during the beginning of my career. Um, I'm now into a new place trying to make new friends and uh, uh, sometimes please new leaders to get what we uh, need to do. But that's life, I guess. So before the talk, um, I was really worried that how can I uh, beat Kamal? He's a good speaker, he's a great researcher. I'm not the level of his academic career. But you know what? If we were discussing the x-ray on the left side, I have no problem, I'll be the winner. But if we discuss a case on the right side, definitely the Turkish team will win. Now, he made my job even easier when I was listening to his brilliant talk and he talked about mini perk and super mini perk and showed the excellent work that he's doing. I said, the job is easy. I don't have to convince the audience about how important his shockwave is. Um, let's keep on. We'll try to make this interesting, but again, we both are uh, trying to send a message of safety and efficacy. Now, before having a debate, what are we really debating? Um, and to tell you, my first uh, project was given to me by Hassan Razvi, who was my program director, is to look at the pediatric shockwave in London, Ontario, which was one of the biggest series in the world. That was when I started my urology training, and that was uh, published then. So we are looking at safety, effectiveness, and the cost before we say who would win. Um, so Kamal talked about the initial introduction of pediatric PCNL when in the mid 80s Woodside uh, published his experience on seven kids using adult instruments, and they were all stone free with no complication. Subsequently, Praxer, when he was with Clayman, he published about the safety of PCNL with adult instruments and pig models, and again, that was published with no scarring. Uh, further study of uh, clinical aspects. In 61 patients, Dawaba has published that there was no increase in scarring. A very well-designed study from Central Indian, Wadwa uh, published only on 14 children, but those children had the advantage of pre-operative and post-operative imaging with GFR, ultrasound, and nuclear scan. And again, there was no difference in post-operative renal function. Now, what about safety of shockwave? I know Kamal is saying nice words about shockwave, how good they are, but he started his talk with a very important uh, statement that it's not FDA approved. And no matter what you think of the FDA, it's a respectable body that looks after patients. So this is put in mind. Now let's go. Before we introduce something, we have to look at the introduction of level of evidence. Now, Newman has studied shockwave in dog kidneys, and there was a negative effect and fibrosis uh, on the parenchyma. Subsequently, rabbit Morris, more, uh, rabbit model. Again, subsequent parenchymal fibrosis. What about human? Lifshitz uh, in uh, 1998 uh, looked at adult uh, pediatric kidney and there was some negative effect. You may um, say these are the old model with HM3, but again, we are presenting the literature. Um, issues in shockwave, uh, is it really safe? It's obviously the least invasive, patients like it. You may say Kamal showed us he can do it with neurolipid anesthesia or sedation, but uh, it's like gunshot. You may, general surgeon taught us to look around the target or trajectory. Scarring has been looked at. Um, Le Chevalier and his colleague looked at the patient with a game preoperative at 10 hours and even late uh, DMSA after 30 days in 22 patients, half of them almost have shockwave and have PCNL, and those with shockwave were seven had scarring. So this is a significant study. What about the potential effect of diabetes and hypertension? You know, this was a big debate uh, or a big talk after uh, the late Segura published the Mayo Clinic uh, database and uh, cohort study when they saw increased diabetes and hypertension um, later on in life. Again, the same thing was found by Montgomery Group, where 8.1% of patients developed hypertension up to four years in follow-up. So 
I don't know, do we tell our patient these things? I think they should know about these, though they've been uh, debated negatively from other colleagues. Now, let's look at the Cochrane Library Review. In, um, in a, a review by uh, this publisher, uh, there was an end point, which is the strong free rate and the need for ancillary procedure or reprocedure. And those uh, showed the favor of uh, percutaneous surgery in those aspects. Uh, we know about the less invasiveness in the pediatric population, but we are focusing about safety and efficacy. So definitely you need more procedure and you need, uh, you have higher stone free rate. Um, have we looked at comparison head to head? Uh, let's see, Ahmed and uh, colleagues in Egypt did a nice study where they compared, this is an adult study, but they look at hard stone. And uh, these are the range that you would probably argue many PCNL, 10 to 20 millimeter. But the interesting thing, the stone free rate was 30% in the shockwave and almost uh, complete stone free in the PCNL. And also when you look at, we talked about the fluoroscopy and radiation, those are also more with the shockwave because you needed many uh, multiple treatments. I know you are telling me now the stones are very hard here. You are picking very hard to show that it's negative. But again, um, a lot of urologists will not know these different important factors like you and I would choose, uh, you know, when to do them because as I will come again in some studies that we've done, um, stones were over-treated by some people more than what the guideline allows you. In this study about efficacy, even with many per using laser energy, and it shows you the stone free rate to be very good. Um, regarding efficacy, again, multiple studies have looked at the uh, stone free rate. This is a nice review from the group of uh, Rasby in London, uh, Ontario where they collected database of more than 2,000 people over 20 years, a big database, and they looked at 39 pediatric patients with one to four ratio. They looked at annual pediatric and matched them to equal uh, demographics and sizes of stones with adults. And they had a primary and secondary outlook. And the primary um, and secondary, they were no, none, not different from the adult population. Uh, except that there were more second-looking kids. Um, again, this is the study I was showing you. This is the guideline. This is a late st study in children by the European Urology Group, expert group who sat and decided who should get what. So I, as you can see, uh, the first one, apparently my hands are not stable. So the stag form, uh, the first option is PCN in the list of the highlighted yellow is something that's not even debatable. More than 20 uh, millimeter, lower pole more than 10. You may find in the literature some people going beyond the recommendation, but these are respected groups. They were including Kamal who came with these guidelines of the expert group. Uh, again, one of the drawbacks is they say, you're going to do a PCNL, you're going to put a nephrostomy. We know all the advantage of uh, and function of nephrostomy tube. And we know that what it's caused from pain and leakage and infection. Um, these are the indication when we do a PCNL, when to leave a nephrostomy tube. Uh, but again, the literature and evidence came with the tubeless PCNL. And this meta-analysis uh, study that was published in the British Journal uh, shows that tubeless PCNL is a good and safe option. Uh, and subsequent pediatric uh, tubeless PCNL have been showed by Samad and his colleagues. Uh, the recent EAU guidelines I have mentioned yesterday, uh, it's a grade A evidence level uh, 1B. This is a patient I did with, uh, as you can see in my right hand, I used the peel away sheet from uh, interventional radiology, we did not have a mini perk like the one we had. I think Turkey has a lot of money, so at the moment we did not buy it, but uh, uh, the patient was stent free and stone free. So, something we did not uh, mention is the cost. Now, 
I know if you read the literature, the cumulative or eventual effect of cost is probably cheaper with shockwave, but the initial acquisition of the device in a growing hospital or a starting hospital is, is very high. You can see these numbers despite now uh, Dorney has stopped their uh, top of the uh, top of the state uh, device. It's pulled out of the market. I think the highest is Sigma, but its price is about 1 million US, about 3.8 uh, uh, Saudi Riyal million. And not only that, there is high logistic cost of getting the space training the nurses. Uh, so uh, the only advantage of that, it's the eventual cost of you have it, as was shown by Mitlaga and his group, where they looked uh, from an NIH uh, grant, look at the economics and outcome for treatment of kidney and renal stone, and they found that urethroscopy followed by shockwave, then PCNL was the most expensive. Um, I would like to, uh, if you allow me to share our experience um, that I started in King Saud University and uh, with my two other hospitals. Uh, so we had an 84 procedure in the last 20 years, uh, 15 years. Their age ranged from 10 months to uh, 17 years with, uh, so that's the stone side, about 36. Majority of stone were staghorn, and we used all available uh, uh, dilating devices ranging on the duration and the time. Initially, I was doing them all with the adult instrument using the uh, 18 French self dilator. Uh, if I can start this video, can you help me here? So, these are the steps of uh, the procedure we usually put a ureteric catheter, and subsequently, this is a, a child with sanjit sakati syndrome, we just published that, who had a, uh, a stag horn, and uh, after putting the ureteric catheter, we choose our calyx. I don't go in until I get a catheter, a guide wire in the bladder, then I change it with an extra stiff wire to avoid the point uh, one of my uh, Kuwaiti colleagues mentioned, with the kidney moving forward, and. Uh, uh, Dr. Razvi mentioned that he liked to have an extra stiff wire just to hold the kidney in place. Um, after we get the wire down, given that we are in residency program, we try to use a coaxial set to put a second guide wire. And subsequent here, I use a peel away 11 French uh, uh, sheath, and I used a, a, a urethroscope, a 6.9 uh, urethroscope, and laser the fragments and pull it out. At the end, we used flexible nephroscopy using a disposable urethroscope and uh, make sure the kidney and the ureter are clean. Um, at the end, we do nephrostogram uh, if the patient needs a stent or uh, completely tubeless. Um, this is another child that we choose to do an upper puncture. Uh, can you help me to start this? So, uh, when uh, we think upper pole puncture as superior as most endurologists who work in the prone position, it gives you the um, nice trajectory to navigate the whole kidney and uh, explore uh, all the calyces with a flexible instrument. And as you can see here, once we get the guide wire in the upper pole, it looks like I can go uh, subcostal or slightly above the uh, full trip. Here I was managed. Uh, I could manage going uh, subcostal in, super, in the upper calyx. And as you can see, I can go all the way down with the ureter and, uh, at the end, leaving a stent. So once you go in, you have different with the tripsy modality that you can choose from. I'm not going to go in detail. Our complication rate were highest initially when we started our studies. But uh, these are our numbers. Uh, Total of eight uh, patients had complications. The liver injury patient, the uh, when we call the liver surgeon, the nephrostomy tube was there. We just pulled it out like a drain, and nothing happened. Um, so uh, this is our analysis. As I said, we are at a referral center, so you see a lot of cysteine still in Saudi Arabia with the relative related marriages. We get a lot of cysteine stones. People who practice there would know that. Unfortunately, these are. Uh, unfortunate patient who will be your regular customers. When we do metabolic assessment, like we do with all kids, um, this is what we found. Majority of them are cysteinuric just by uh, bias. Um, 
a lot of them have normal 24 hour uh, urine collection but again 80, uh, about 80 percent of them don't show up in time so in conclusion what is best uh, bcnl is best for so and i think my colleague will agree to send the message that complex or a staghorn stone if you have a hard stone if you have a patient with recurrent stone we know even proponent of shock wave, don't do a lot of shock waves. We know those will cause eventual scarring. Cysteine, especially if they're homogeneous cysteine, they don't break up. That's the way the molecule is made. Don't shock them. Um, as you see in the guideline, lower pole more than a centimeter. If you have a distal obstruction, you can have the ability to have a flexible scope going from the kidney and removing. We are able all the way, all the time, to do a flexible urethroscopy and reach the bladder and. A, I always show the resident and ask them the question, what is this showing in the balloon of the polycatheter? And most of the time, a junior resident wouldn't know what that is, but uh, it's easy as non-traumatic. Uh, again, when you have failed shock waves, I don't know, Kamal showed me that uh, studies showing second look and third look. In my country, the insurance will give you codes even for third look or repeated look. So is that safe or not? And we know from the literature, a Turkish study have shown the scarring rate after multiple shock waves. Um, when you have multiple calculi, what do you shock? You definitely will go for a mini perk. At the end, I thank you, and I wish all everybody the best, and for our national team the best.